Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We want to welcome your presence. And God's presence. Your love and support plays a vital role in the journey towards healing. for Mike and Gina and their children. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for your presence here in our hearts and in our lives and in the hearts and lives of Mike and Jean and their family. Thank you that your love flows through your children to others. Lord, I pray that you would especially be with Mike and Gina, Brent and Kendon, Ashley, Lena and Alea, also, my heart goes out to Irvin and Ruth and Earl and Edna, grandparents. Give them a special grace. I pray that your love would flow through the messages that are ahead of us here, praying for Earl as he brings a meditation, for Lucas Hilty as he brings the message, for Kyle as he leads in songs, and for everyone else who has part this morning. Be with us. Lord, I pray for those who are serving us food, all the hard work that goes into these events, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your holy presence. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the hope of eternal life that we have. Amen. You can turn in your hymn books to song number 521. Song number 521. <clears throat>
You can next turn to song number 723. Seven hundred twenty Turn yet to song number 
So what does a person do with a phone call that has an unbidden, undesired, and greatly unwelcome message? I remember Saturday morning. It was a good morning. Saturday is one of my favorite days of the week. And I remember of going out to the room above our garage where time and again I have met with God. And I remember in my time of prayer there with God that I told him that I have an agenda for today. And I did. First of all, I was going to give some preparation time for my Sunday school class. And then there were other things to do around the house, including I was expecting if the weather is fit that I'm going to roll the lawn with our lawn roller. So I told God I had an agenda for today, but then I added this. I said, I want my agenda to be your agenda. I had no idea at that point that something had already taken place that was going to greatly change the events of the day. And as I was preparing there uh, for the Sunday school class, I heard our landline ring. The base is downstairs in the garage. And that was a little unusual. It's almost obsolete, the landline, that is. And uh, so I didn't give too much thought to it. But when it rang the second time, oh, maybe I need to check, see what's going on. So I went down. And there there was a, I, I could see the phone calls. And it said, Michael Peachy. Now, why would Michael be calling on our landline? And so I tried to call back. I couldn't connect. And before I could try again, my cell phone rang. And it was Mark. And I could tell as his voice was breaking. And he said, Dad. And before he said anything else, I said, Oh, no. Because I knew something. So what does a person do? And you know where you were at when you heard. I don't know what else to do. And I don't quite like the way that sounds. Because this is not the only reason. But I don't know what else to do to turn to the one who has identified himself as the God of all comfort. And I know that question arises inevitable. Why? But there's something more important than having that question answered. I remember after going in and telling Edna, and uh, we're trying to pick up and decide what to do, and I went back out to the room where I had been to collect my things there, and I remember of telling God this. God, I'm with you all the way.
I know of nothing better. Again, I don't like the way that sounds. But the deepest desire of my heart is to experience the union with Jesus Christ at the time of this valley. And let me just say that receiving a phone call like this is hard. There's no other way. It's hard. And uh, perhaps we can identify with Job when he said, that which I feared greatly has come upon me. But as I was thinking about these matters, my mind went to a favorite portion of Scripture. It's been with me now for quite a little while, and I've tried to commit it to my faulty, mem faulty memory. And uh, this is a man, a man of God, who was struggling also. He didn't understand why there were so many difficulties he had to go through when others who weren't even professing to follow after the God of all comfort were having it so easy. And things were going so smoothly. And yea, even today, there are people who are going about their lives in a normal fashion, and some of them are glad and happy and, and all that, and, and, and everything is normal for us. It's not. And so it's easy to be a bit envious. Hmm. And so he too was envious until he had came into the sanctuary with God. And then his eyes were opened. And he could see clearly. And he was convicted about his envy. And here's what he says. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee, or an animal before thee. He had only been thinking about things in a natural way. But he adds this. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. So even in the midst of the struggle he was having and the envy, he's saying, God, you still had me. You didn't leave me. And then he adds these words. And as we think about going from here and questions and how will this be and, and all these types of things which we can torture ourselves with, he says, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Huh. But that's not all he said. He said, And afterward receive me to glory. in heaven but thee there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee my flesh and my heart faileth but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever For lo, all they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. 
So we know enough about God to know that there is no answer elsewhere. There is no comfort to be found elsewhere. Now, I want to make clear that God does give comfort uh, not only when we are in prayer and talking and listening to him, but also through people. And I want to say something to this community, to this church, to this school. Thank you for what you have done this past week. You have shown a description of love. And I want to say yet further, not only this week, thank you for how you have shaped Vincent's life. I'm saying that as his grandpa. You, you had more impact upon him than I did. I did not see him regularly. So I want to say thank you for all that you have done directly and indirectly. He then comes and says this, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. So it is hard. It is difficult. It is a valley. But I can say along with the prophet here, and I'm speaking not because I'm a preacher or not because this is something that, that is nice to say at a time like this. I'm speaking because this is really the way it is within me here. It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Now I wonder if we as a group would like to respond to this. And uh, I'm wondering, I know we don't have Many of us don't have our Bibles here, and maybe we don't have King James here. That's all right. But I'm just wondering if we would like to repeat together this last verse. And don't repeat it if it's not your heart. But if it's your heart, then repeat it with me. And I'm going to change the pronouns a little bit uh, so that it's us and not me. And we'll start here with the first part of the verse. Uh, we'll, we'll say it like this, but it is good for us to draw near to God. Okay? Can we say that together? But it is good for us to draw near to God. Now, the last part is, we have put our trust in the Lord God that we may declare all thy works. Can we say it? We have put our trust in the Lord God that we may declare all thy works. Heavenly Father, here we are. You've heard us. We need your help. But we praise you that you are the one true God, the God of all comfort. And now, Lord, we are opening our eyes and our ears to receive your comfort. We're watching today, not only today, but in the days to come. May your good hand of comfort be upon Mike and Gina and their family and this community and all of us here in Jesus' name. It's been, um, 
at times over the past week, I've, I've uh, remembered and felt what it was like, um, I guess it's 21 years ago, when my brother, who was 14, was killed. Um, one thing anchored me during that time, and I, and I was, at that point, I was not, I would, wouldn't say that I was converted or a Christian, but um, the sense of God's love, the, my best friend, I'd found him gone, and um, I couldn't understand this in the least, but I knew, without anyone even telling me, that God truly loved my brother in a way that even I could not and none of us could. And I hope that, I don't know what you've been feeling, family, uh, many of us feel mixtures of things, and sometimes it feels like we don't feel the right things at the right time, sometimes. But I hope that you can, you can uh, remember, whether you feel it or not, the love of God, the pure goodness of His heart. So, it was about two days after Jesus had offered um, what we sometimes call the Sermon on the Mount, and sometimes the Sermon on the Plain, and we're not sure if those were actually the same sermon or the, uh, the same sermon preached twice. But this was the Sermon on the Plain, and he'd ended that sermon. It was the one where he ends with saying that there were two men, one built on sand and one built on a rock, and the one building on the rock is placing your full confidence, the confidence for your life in the Lord and obeying him. And so... He was, Jesus was traveling from place to place, and there was, there was a good-sized crowd with him. There were his disciples and other people who wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. And they were coming into to a small town, like a village or a small city. It was about 10 miles as the crow flies from where Jesus had grown up in Nazareth. And the city was called Nain. And as they were coming toward the city, they saw, there was another crowd coming out toward them. It was also not a small crowd. It was a funeral crowd. It was a crowd of people, the friends, the relatives, the neighbors, who had gathered around a woman who had just lost her only son. She had lost her husband before that. And now she had a double grief and another burden. Her only child was gone. Um, Death is always a shock. It's always painful. We're never really emotionally prepared for it. But especially so when it is, I'm told, when it is uh, parents surviving their children, uh, that's not something that we expect or hope for. Although the first mother, the mother of all living, lost her son before, before she herself died. So this young man, they were carrying him out of the city of Nain. We don't know how old he was. He was a young man. Maybe he was a teenager, maybe a little bit older than that. And the two crowds were, were converging. They were coming together. One full of grief, one full of the ideas and teachings of righteousness. And so what will happen when the two crowds meet? How will this teacher of righteousness, Jesus, how will he respond to the very human emotions of grief and loss? Jesus saw them. Scripture says that he, when he saw her, the mother, when he saw her, he had compassion on her. He saw the crowd. He saw the grieving mother, the friends gathering around, and he felt the ache that seemed to hang in the air, and he had compassion on her. We're here to remember and honor the life of a young person whose seemed his manhood was just unfolding. Um, when we started coming to this church, Vincent was just one of the, uh, I guess he was a first grader, and um, 
And only in the last couple of months, I began to notice Vincent's like, wow, he's becoming a young man. I, I, I was looking forward to seeing how this unfolds, seeing his personality, his strength, his character coming out and, and being uh, unfurled to us. But those things that we'd hoped for have been taken away. And so whether you're a parent or a sibling or cousin or an uncle or aunt or a classmate, there's just a tremendous sense of loss with that. And those of us, there are those of us here who also didn't interact with Vincent that much, but we feel the loss and it can be hard for us even to feel the, to know how to feel, to know how to process this thing. How should we process whatever we're feeling? Well, we'll look today at some scriptural help for grieving, some ways that scripture teaches us to work through and walk through grief and loss. But first, let's recognize that death is a stranger to us. Now, death is common. It must happen to all of us unless the Lord returns first. Scripture says that death came upon all men, and so it has. But because it is common and because it happens a lot to all of us, that doesn't make it normal. It's not part of the original design for you and me. There's a sense in which, now nothing is beyond what God controls and uh, redeems, but there's still a sense in which God didn't make Vincent for this. God made us for life. He made us to walk with him, to know him, and to walk with each other and know each other. It was only after sin came into the picture um, that the Lord spoke to Adam and said, Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. And even in this, there is mercy. But still, death is the loosing of the knot that binds us to this life and to all those things that we desire, the, the things that we love here and delight in and pursue. Scripture says that death is our last enemy. And so processing that is not easy. But, in particular, it's a loss for those of us who are left behind. Remember that when Jesus met the widow coming out of Nain, it doesn't say that he felt sorry for the young man who died, but it says that he looked on his mother and he had compassion on her. Because when we lose someone, it's a real loss. And we can't wish it away or just ignore it or even spiritualize it away to a certain extent. It's there and it hurts. And Rachel is weeping for her children and cannot be comforted because they are not. When someone goes out of our lives, our lives are built with connections. Whether you're a social person uh, or less so, all of us, our lives are filled with the people we see, the people we talk to, the people we enjoy, even those we don't. And when someone goes out of our lives, particularly when someone who's so close to us, it's, it's taking some of our internal furniture away. It's breaking the china in our own cupboards. It's tearing a, a gash in the fabric of who we are. So how do we respond to this, this loss of this person, this dear young man who had a place in so many of our lives? Our sorrow is real. But it is God's will that we also find comfort, that we not be overwhelmed by this grief. Jesus, the same one who met the widow coming out of Nain, he wants to walk us through this process, this grief. And this is the, the first thing I would offer us, the first thing to remember and to anchor ourselves on as we go through the process of grieving is this, the ministry of Jesus on earth. That is, what did he do when he was among us? Remember his ministry among us. Remember, 
He always did the will of the Father. Jesus' act of goodness, his, his teaching and his compassion, these were not simply uh, uh, Jesus responding uh, reactively to the tremendous need that he saw, but he was exemplifying and presenting and enfleshing what God wanted. And often that meant healing the sick, casting out devils, and yes, even raising people from the dead. And so when he met her, this widow of Nain who had lost her son, he saw her sorrow and he had compassion on her. And he didn't give her a nice little uh, motto, a philosophy to work through her grief. He said, he walked up to, they were carrying, they were still walking, the crowds were still moving. And he walked up to the coffin and he touched it. And the pallbearers stopped. And he said to the woman, don't weep. And he said to the young man, I say to you, arise. And he did. And he presented him back to his mother. What Jesus did in that moment, the way he responded to loss, to grief, shows us something of, shows us his care for the sorrow of each of us. It gives us a window into God's heart and how God feels about death and how he feels about grief. When the people in that crowd saw what Jesus had done, they said, they, it's, the Bible says that they glorified God. That is, they gave God glory, weight. They said, this is, they said two things. A great prophet has risen up among us and... and God has visited his people. This was God taking care of his people, coming to them in their need. All the things that Jesus did showed us what kind of life he wants to give us, what kind of restoration and renewal his kingdom brings. In this story, this, this story is found in Luke chapter 7, and the very next thing that, that Luke writes is that John sent his disciples to ask, are you for real Messiah, or are we still waiting for that one? John had prophesied, had, had inaugurated in a way Jesus' ministry, or introduced it, and now he was, he was having his doubts. What is, what is this kingdom of God that Jesus is bringing? Is this really what we're looking for? And it so happened that in that moment when, when John's disciples came to Jesus, Jesus was very active. He was um, casting out demons. He was healing the lame. He was healing the blind. He was opening the ears of those who couldn't hear. <clears throat> and when he had time, he turned to John's disciples and he said, Tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed are those, blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. John, this is the real thing. This is the kingdom of God. This is what it looks like. People are healed. People are made whole. We should take comfort in the fact that Jesus demonstrated for us that his kingdom is a kingdom where we are made whole, and where losses are restored, and where we are comforted. He sees our grief now. So the, this ministry of Jesus shows us his heart for our hearts. But still, we're here. We're here dealing with a loss. And we still deal with a world that is broken in many ways. We still have blindness, lameness, deafness, poverty, and death around us. And we still have sin. <clears throat> Not only do we need the comfort of the fact that Jesus, back there, gave us a picture, a window, into what he wanted for us, but we need to know, we need to trust in the promise of the resurrection. 
The kingdom is coming in its fullness. You see, Jesus himself, after he raised the dead, after he healed the sick, he himself went to the cross and his mother, a sword pierced her heart as she saw her son pass away. But three days later, he rose again. And scripture teaches us that this is our hope. Jesus himself going through death and coming into life. <clears throat> Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, a group of a pastoral team, they were writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, which is in uh, Macedonia at the time. And they were exhorting these Christians to grow in their love for each other. And the, 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 the Thessalonians were dealing with a lot of, they were, kind of, they were young Christians, and there was a lot of opposition. People were saying things and doing things that were difficult. And Paul reminded, or Paul or this, whoever wrote the letter reminded them that God will come and he will punish those who oppose you. Eventually, like we heard this morning, it doesn't always look like it now, but eventually things will be put right. And those who have consistently hated uh, goodness and turned their hearts against God, they will be punished. But then there's this, and he talks to them about loving the brothers, but then there's this raises this, this problem that Christians are dying too. Those who are faithful to the Lord were passing away. And he writes in chapter 4, verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have fallen asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So pain is, is a part of losing someone. Jesus, when he <clears throat> went to see his friends, he knew that Lazarus would be raised in a matter of, I guess, minutes. But still Jesus wept. He wept for the pain that was there. But here <clears throat> we are taught of, of the scripture that our sorrow should not be like those who sorrow hopelessly, those who have no hope. <clears throat> that you sorrow not, that you're not drugged down by this grief, this loss. That it doesn't so weigh you down that you become impervious to the joys of life and incapable of serving the Lord. Grief is real, but it should not disable us. And why not, Paul? What, what can you tell us? What, what is there that can, can lead us through this valley? It will not do to just rationalize the grief and to say that on balance, we have a lot of good things to be thankful for because the thing that we feel when we go through grief is that we love this person and we want to honor him with the way we live from now. We want to <clears throat> honor the connection that we had with the person we lost. And so what comes next is not a rationalization that death is just something we have to get used to. No, there's more. For if we believe, Paul writes, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. And so we could read that as those who sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. Or we could read it as those who sleep in Jesus, God will bring them with him. So, Jesus died, and we know that he rose again from the dead. And he's seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us. So that's victory. That's victory over death. But it's still not the end of the story. Not for Jesus, and not for us. The kingdoms of this world have not yet, in practice, become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Jesus has, has won the victory over death, but still, we have death. We still have bodies that need to be brought into subjection to the Holy Spirit, to be taught uh, by Him. There's, the world is still broken. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, 
But we're in an intermediate stage, and there's another stage coming. Jesus will come back, and He will come back to set things right. All things. Scripture speaks of the restoration of all things. He will come to receive the kingdom from His Father. And when He comes, He will bring those who sleep with Him. His inauguration is our restoration. God will bring with Him those who are in His care. Scripture goes on to say, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. We will be with the Lord who returned the widow's son to her. The Lord who touched the blind eyes and the deaf ears and the leper's skin. The Lord who is the restorer will be with him. The pain in our hearts, the pain that we feel now at our loss is a sign to us. It's a witness that God is working. God will do something with that pain. He will bring more beauty to us than we had before. We've been wounded so we can be mended, so we can be healed. And that mending starts here. That healing starts as we're comforted by this hope by the knowledge that our loved ones are in the, in the care of a God who is their Father, who loves them. But ultimately, too, we will be healed by His presence, in His presence. We'll re, re, we will be restored to all the love and all that we have lost. And so if we remember how Jesus lived among us and how He blessed us and how He did good everywhere, and if we remember and, and trust in the resurrection, we're still here, right? We're still here in this place at this moment. And so the third thing that I want you to consider is that we should find strength in Jesus' people. Waiting can be long and it can be painful. It is painful. But Paul, or Sylvanus, or Timothy, whoever had the pen to paper at this point, says to the Thessalonians, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So there are several ways in which we can give each other strength as God's people. And one of them is this, with these words, bringing comfort to each other by speaking together of what we've lost, of what we're feeling, but of also of the hope that we have for what the people we've lost, for Vincent and whatever we've lost. There will be times when you, will, probably, when you need to get alone and just, I remember where, uh, as a 17-year-old boy, I didn't know what to do with grief. I didn't actually know, I wasn't familiar with it. And so, but it, just the dull ache was in, unbearable at times, and I just had to get away. And so sometimes that will, that will uh, maybe happen to you. You just need to go somewhere by yourself with the Lord and talk about it and just wait. And maybe you'll experience Him. In a, just the waiting is an experience. It's, it, it will form your souls. But it's also important then to talk to each other and to stay in touch and to, to um, talk to people who care about you, people who know you and who love you, and who love the Lord, and who know the Lord. So we, should, we, we need to comfort each other with words, and there's one additional way in which we give strength to each other. And that's simply the... Uh, I, I don't like to use this term, but it is uh, actually appropriate here, and that is just to do life together. That is showing up and taking care of things together. So this passage on comfort and on the hope for the resurrection 
comes right after Paul, I'm going to say Paul, is um, encouraging the Thessalonians, excuse me, about Philadelphia, the brotherly love. And he says, you know this, you're doing it, okay, but I just want, we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more in loving each other. And, and here's what love is look, looks like, according to Paul, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, the way that verse was first used in my life, and the way I tend to, to hear it is, don't be lazy, and go do your work, and um, be industrious. And that is true. That is what it is saying. But um, think about this as an, an illustration or a description of living together in love. To aspire to lead a quiet life and to mind your own business. Um, mind your own business means not so much keep your nose in your things and out of my things as much as it means take care of the things that are yours. Do your own stuff. Take care of stuff. So what does that mean in a family? If mom has a birthday, maybe call her. Or I don't know what, the, what your own ways are as a family, but go ahead and show up. Go ahead and do the things. If the lawn needs mowed, this is not just family. If the lawn needs to be mowed, that's, that's, uh, we ought to take care of that. If, if there are family rhythms, family gatherings, um, ways that we, you can show up for each other, go ahead and do that. See what needs to be done and do it. I'm just always, I'm just so struck by the, the power of the message that we send when we just walk in and start helping. And people have done this for us so much, so I, I know, but, but without ever saying, I love you and you mean a lot to me, which we should say, when, when you walk into Mike and Gina's home and you just start helping, or you're just present, whatever's helpful, it won't always be the same thing, but you're showing to them, you're showing them, I see you, you belong, your concerns are my concerns, your stuff matters to me. We're just, we're family. And that's, that's for you as a family, but that's for us as a church family as well. And in doing this, um, Paul writes that we may walk properly to those who are outside and that we may lack nothing. The scripture, the pain of death and the pain of loss is real. But God wants us to be comforted and he wants us to find a way of healing through this. And it will take time, but he will show us through. To, to the family, I think a lot of you all. And to you and to all of us. Treasure, going forward, treasure the wonder of the the gift of having known Vincent. Rest your heart on the good-heartedness of God who gave us Vincent and who still is caring for him and who loves him more than any of us could. And believe in the resurrection.
I'm Piper Burge, and along with Mr. Miller, I teach grades seven and eight at Faith Builders Christian School. Vincent was my student. On Sunday, his family asked our class to write a tribute and read it at his funeral. Thank you, Mike and Gina, for inviting us to participate in this way. Before we read our tribute, we want you to know that it is truly the heart and contributions of our whole class. On Wednesday, Vincent's class of 21 remaining 7th and 8th graders worked with Mr. Miller and me in a two-hour session. Each student listed Vincent's character traits, descriptions of his personality, and things they loved and missed about him. They wrote down memories. They noted his unique habits. And they reflected on what they have learned in this past week of grieving and remembering. That night, I took their ideas and words and wrote our collective tribute to Vincent. Yesterday, our class heard, discussed, and agreed that this is what we want to say. Now, we offer it to you. Mr. Miller and I are joined by Vincent's first cousin, Jarius, and the eighth grade men. We read on behalf of our whole class. <coughs> Vincent was our classmate and friend. We have shared a classroom with him each school year for the past almost eight years. This week, we have spent hours with our memories, looking at pictures and recalling shared experiences. Today, we are grateful to celebrate our friend Vincent with you. As we think about Vincent, we realize he didn't seek out the center stage. He wasn't flashy or extreme, but he did do whatever was in front of him with vigor and focus. We remember his steady energy and cheerful attitude. Vincent didn't seek attention, but neither did he avoid it. He was willing to stick his neck out when a neck was needed. In music class, he sang. If he was going to make a mistake, it could be heard and fixed. 
We miss his voice and his confidence when we sing without him now. School was important for Vin to Vincent. He was good at it, but he also worked hard. In math class, he was the best the next best thing to Mr. Kyle. We often turned to him to help for help or consulted him to see if our answers were on track. Looking back, it feels like we may have been imposing on him, but he didn't make it feel that way. People were important to Vincent. Many of us marvel at how comfortable we felt with him. Vincent's willingness to engage with you wasn't based on how cool or popular you were. He could talk with anyone about anything and felt natural. We've known Vincent for a long time. We've known his prickles as well as his great qualities. But as we reflected together, we realized that some of the things that we would have said characterized him in elementary school have softened or shifted in the past year or so. In second or third grade, Vincent would argue relentlessly. He'd verbally clobber anyone who thought that Dodges were better than Fords. That changed, though. Recently, Vincent demonstrated an uncanny ability to move a group from futile argument to productive conversation. It's hard to put into words exactly what he would do. Was it gentle sarcasm or wry logic? He'd ask a question that made you realize that you were thinking poorly or that you didn't really mean that thing you had just loudly claimed. You knew he thought you were wrong, but he wasn't confrontational about it. He allowed you the dignity of owning your mistake. In third and fourth grade, we remember Vincent being very competitive and needing to sit out on the sidelines sometimes to cool off. But the Vincent we knew in eighth grade was a much more disciplined person. He played hard. He was good at many of our favorite games, but he didn't flout it. We can all picture him whizzing one of the yellow and black bumblebee balls across the gym in a hard-fought game of scatter or snagging a ball out of the air when playing across the line. If he was annoyed, he'd express it with a heartfelt, come on and then let it go. When we think of Vincent, we think of his sounds. He had a unique laugh, full bore laughing with a giggle mixed in. When he was in just the right mood, he could let out a freaky, impressively high-pitched scream. And he had a commanding voice. In early elementary, that voice dominated our chants. This year, as we recited from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Vincent's voice led the class each morning. We haven't recited Bible memory this past week. It's hard to imagine doing it without his pace-setting tone. Vincent was a good leader. Whether organizing a recess committee meeting or heading up a group project, he would make sure that he understood what needed to be done, and then he would make sure that it happened. People trusted him. If Vincent said that this was the right way to do something, we knew we could depend on that. At the same time, he wasn't afraid to admit he was wrong when he made a mistake. Vincent believed in prayer. He offered prayer requests for people he cared about. This year, our class has prayed for his aunts and uncles and cousins as they face difficult health needs or the loss of family members. We've prayed for members of the Plainview Church family who were fighting cancer or recovering from injuries. We've prayed for you because Vincent brought you to us. Today, we want you to know that we are praying for you and grieving with you as you mourn his loss. In the past week, we have learned lessons we didn't sign up for this year. 
We have learned that none of us know what God has planned for us and that living well requires faith. We have learned that we must be ready whenever God calls us because we don't know when it's going to be. We don't know what our future looks like. We have learned how much every person matters. We realize that getting to know people is important because they will change your life. We have learned how kind people are and how much they care about us. Now we know how much we miss someone after they are gone. We are learning how to speak our feelings and to listen to each other. In this, our closest encounter with death, we are learning how to have a healthy grieving process. We have realized how good it is to have parents and others we trust in our lives. Most of all, we are learning to lean on Jesus more. For us, this means believing that, even though we are all sad and lonely, Vincent is not because he's with Jesus. He is happier than he's ever been before. Vincent's death has made us think differently about heaven. We are sad, but we are reminding ourselves that this is the best thing that has ever happened to Vincent. That was a very meaningful, meaningful service. The reading of the obituary. Vincent Lane Peachy, age 13, of Centerville, PA, passed away unexpectedly in his sleep on Saturday, March 25th, 2023, at his home. He was born April 13th, 2009. He will be deeply missed by his parents. Mike and Gina, along with his siblings, Brent, age 21, and fiance, Allison Nisley. Kendon, age 20, special friend, Kelsey Stitzman. Ashley, aged 18, special friend, Caleb Yoder. Lena, age seven, and Aaliyah, aged one. He is also survived by maternal grandparents, Irvin and Ruth Miller, and paternal grandparents, Earl and Edna Peachy, and paternal great-grandfather, Perry E. Martha Bontrager. He is also survived by many aunts, uncles, and cousins. Vincent was an energetic young man who loved reading, going to school, lawn care during the summer, and helping Uncle Jason on the farm along with his cousins. He was a hard worker who rarely complained and was always eager to help. His cheerful disposition will be greatly missed in the community. We lay Vincent to rest in assurance and hope of the resurrection. The burial commit committal service will follow with Martin Schlebaugh officiating. <clears throat> A note of thanks from the Mike Peachy family. They would like to thank everyone for their tremendous support. The meals, visits, and prayers were much appreciated. 
Your presence here today is felt deeply, and we feel your love and support as we go through this journey of loss and sorrow of losing our son and brother. We ask that you continue to keep us in your prayers. We also thank you as a church here for being here and for the local churches and individuals who have been a help in this. I'll have the prayer, have a prayer, and ask a blessing on the noon meal, and then give the announcements. Let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and uh, we feel your love. We know you love us, and uh, we have felt your presence today as we heard from you through the song service and uh, the message, the devotional, and, we, and, and the tribute from the students. Our hearts are turned toward you, and we thank you that you care for us when, they're, when we're going through a valley. We ask that you'd be with Mike and Gina, give them grace for the journey of sorrow, faith to put their trust in you. We ask that you would comfort Mike and Gina, Brent, Kendon, Ashley, Lena, Aaliyah. Lord, today, tomorrow and in the future. The journey is hard. We thank you for your presence and we praise and glorify you. We also ask that you'd bless the food that has been prepared. We ask that you'd bless it to our bodies. Help us, to, Lord, to use the strength to further glorify and honor your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so for announcements, you will be ushered out for the viewing shortly, and as you return to the back of the church, there are two options. So you'll be coming up, you'll be ushered up front for the last viewing, and as you return to the back of the church, there will be two options. If you are not planning to go to the cemetery, but are staying for the noon meal, and all are welcome to stay. Please go out the back of the sanctuary, back the hallway, past the restrooms, and down to the basement where you will be served. If you're not planning to eat the meal or going to the burial, please make an immediate left down the steps and out the front entrance. And go to your car if you're parked here, and and wait for the procession to begin. If your vehicles are parked at Faith Builders, the large yellow school bus is waiting outside at the end of the sidewalk. You will be bused back to the parking lots, and you're welcome to use the Faith Builders restrooms in the Christian school, and then it would be best to return back as quickly as possible, and please turn on your flashers and return to the church and stay out on the road with your flashers on to indicate that you're planning to go to the burial. Traffic control will be helping you. After the vehicles in this church parking lot are out, the vehicles on the road will follow to go to the cemetery. And there is only roadside parking at the cemetery. If you were planning on going to the cemetery and have, your, have changed your mind because of the rain, um, and if you're parked uh, together out here, you still need to go out to your vehicle and move it so that the others can go. So if you plan to go to the cemetery and have changed your mind, you still have to go get your vehicle and move it so that others can go as well. Thank you.
Please turn with me for a final number in your hymn books to song number 983. <clears throat> song number 983.